we've had a very hard time defining what watershed health is because there's so many perspectives to it. But one of the themes that keeps coming up is that that we need to consider all of the beings that are in that watershed, not just to consider watershed health in terms of how human beings look at it, but what value is associated with the beings who live there. How would salmon define watershed health? How would cedars define watershed health? And one of the places that I come to, particularly in trying to weave in indigenous thought to this, is that a healthy watershed is a community of reciprocity a place where all of the pieces are intact and and interact with one another in a in a mutually beneficial reciprocal way and you can't do that if all the parts aren't there mm-hmm. so what are some of the elements of reciprocity i think one of the one of the elements comes in understanding the world as gift on the one hand western scientists view some of the benefits that flow from watershed as ecosystem services and indeed they are that's a a powerful way to define them but you could take the same things and call them gifts that they're gifts from the land and when we're given a gift what's our response to that gratitude um but gratitude isn't enough, I think, to sustain a a watershed or a human community. What do you do out of gratitude? When you receive a gift, you want to give it back. Um, You want to give something else of value back, and it's that gift exchange. It's that kind of reciprocity between people and their place, between salmon and their place, between mayflies and their place. Each has a role, and if you exercise that role, that's your gift to the community. And when everybody exercises their their role or their gift that the place will stay in balance and that's not so different from ecological niche theory um, but embedded in an indigenous way of knowing. Mm-hmm. What about ecological niche theory? <laughs> that's a hard question <laughs> in two words or two minutes you'll edit this part out. <laughs> um, um, in ecological niche theory we understand that every species has a set of circumstances under which it can live and a set of, if you will, functional attributes that it lends to the community. And so the things that it eats, the set of conditions under which it can live, its life history, its nutrient requirements, all of the ways that it lives are part of its ecological niche. But it's unique. Every species has their own set of circumstances um, and their own contributions to the whole. And that's where I see the parallel between ecological niche and what we think of as the unique gifts of, of every species. So as, as humans, um, as the human community, how do we give back? We are a nation of farmers. So how do we give back to the gifts that we've been given from nature? Yeah. How do we give back to a watershed is such an important question. And I think much of that comes from, from respecting the watershed um, and from as as you were mentioning we tend to be a culture associated with our rights what are our rights what are the things that this watershed is going to give me but how different it would be if we understood our place in the natural community is not one of rights of what can I get here what what am I entitled to in terms of ecosystem services but what are my responsibilities to that place Um, and so our responsibilities can be um, met in all kinds of ways um, in in maintaining what is there in not removing the pieces in treating every member of the watershed that you live in as a person Um, and that includes non-human persons. If you accorded the, the trees and the fish and the mayflies the same respect um, that we give to one another as human people, then we'd be in a very different place. Good. Um, so, so as scientists, um, as ecologists that are trying to get this message to a broader audience, um, where do we start in our communities? Do we start in the school systems? Do we start with our community leaders? Do we start with our government? We start restoring relationship to land and waters. Um, To me, it has to be direct exposure. More and more people are sitting in front of televisions and video games, and they're not 
connecting with their places. They, they don't understand the generosity of the land. When people don't even know where their food comes from, we can't fault them for not understanding that it's a watershed that sustains them. So to me, it has to be direct experience. And in our indigenous traditions, we say that the wisdom lives in land. Um, how can you receive that wisdom if you're sitting in front of the television all the time? Um, so I think environmental education, certainly. At the family level, people just taking your kids out, be, taking yourself out into the woods, into the water, getting your hands dirty is a, is a powerful way of connecting with the land. And it's also a piece of reciprocity, getting your hands dirty and working in watershed restoration in, in, in um, being sure that the pieces are there. Maybe it's working to remove in invasive species. Maybe it's working to plant native species. Uh, maybe it's picking up trash along the stream that runs through your community. But that's, that's reciprocity and a way to reestablish relationship with land. Mm -hmm. As a watershed practitioner, we often think we need heavy equipment, big projects, that those are really going to make the difference. And, and maybe it's just these small connections um, of people picking up garbage. Yeah. Yeah. Ecological restoration, what often comes to mind to me is that we think it's the land that's broken. Sometimes it is the land that's broken, but more often it's our relationship to land that's broken. And so if you can begin by healing people's relationships to land, an awful lot of good will flow from that. Um, so in you're a professor at SUNY mm -hmm. New York. In, in your delivery of um, environmental understanding to your students, are, do you find that the awareness has changed over the years? Are people coming to you with less and less um, contact with the natural world? I have to answer that no, but that's because I teach at a very specialized institution at the College of Environmental Science and Forestry. So it's a self-selected group of students who are, are passionate about these issues. Um, but what I do see in my students is while they're passionate in terms of stewardship of the environment, an awful lot of them feel powerless. Um, they're coming to learn about the environment, but they don't know what to do. And some of them actually throw up their hands and say, corporations make all the decisions. What is the rule, role for me? Corporations and government make the decisions, and I am powerless. And that breaks my heart to have 18-year-olds feel like there's nothing that they can do. So it seems to me to be part of our ecological education has to be not only what is the world like, what is its complexity, but how do you claim your power as a citizen of that watershed, and what is it that you can do? So is it your belief that um, as citizens we can make the changes that uh, demand that corporations uh, give back? optimistically that will work. <laughs> it's the only thing we can hope for. The only thing we can hope for is that there is that there's enough political will that people come to value their watersheds, their home places more than they do consumerism. But we've been sold such a, a materialist society that doesn't fill anybody up. Um, it just makes you want more and more empty junk. Um, whereas connecting with your home place fills you up. And, and, if, and if people have that experience, I think that may be something that tips our balance away from this materialist culture to one of stewardship. Um, mm -hmm. I hope so. Focusing people back to the land. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So.